Okay, guys, I'm live. All right. <laughs> and I haven't shaved. Can you guys hear me? As you can see, I'm in a different place. I'm actually a child of God's modest home. Thank that brother. Thank the Lord Jesus for him and his family for their gracious hospitality, allowing me to come here and use their internet free of charge so I can live stream. So pray for a child of God, pray for his family, his spouse, you know, a tremendous brother who loves Jesus Christ, his family loves the Lord. That's why they allow me in their home, even when they're not here and use their internet so I can serve you for the glory of Jesus Christ. Now, the reason why I haven't been able to live, live stream these last past last couple of days is because my brother cut off the internet. So he cut off the internet. So that means I'm going to have to be live streaming here whenever a child of God allows me to live stream. You know, so weekends will be hard because weekends is when he's with the family. So I, I, may, I may not be able to do any weekend live streams, but here, by the grace of Jesus Christ, I can do it Monday through Friday. As long as the Lord Jesus gives me the health I need, refreshes me spiritually, emotionally, mentally, and physically, and keeps me pure for his glory in Jesus' name, I'll keep teaching you. I'll do a few more sessions on live Q&A. So this is where you need to write out your questions. And I'll go back into doing topical studies. And if God wills, not only topical studies, but we'll go through books of the Bible. Maybe we'll go through Genesis or John. As the Spirit leads me, as the Spirit qualifies me, as the Spirit enables me with wisdom and knowledge, understanding, and power from the Spirit in Jesus' name. So pray for the internet connection. All right. So you keep praying for that. So it's good to see you. I haven't seen you guys since when? Sam, what was your opinion on Revelation? Uh, okay, I'll comment on it real quickly. So imputed versus imparted righteous. Why does it matter? Well, vine. Yeah, that's a good question. Im impartation is more Catholic doctrine where God infuses in your soul the quality of righteousness. So now you're in a state of grace. Whereas imputed righteousness means that because of your union with Jesus Christ, you are now <clears throat> declared righteous. And this righteous standing is conferred on you because of what Jesus Christ did for you, which you receive by grace through faith in him. Right? Well, she's live too? Oh, boy. I hate when I do a live session and other people are live. That it stinks. I don't like to compete. Anyway, I'd lose. I'm the least popular apologist. Okay. With that said, let me just ask the Lord to bless and pray for this internet connection too. It's like now this is a little slow. Right? Yep, okay. It's good to be back with you. Thank you, Robbie Stones. Anything good that's from me is because of the grace of the Trine God. So we're going to praise the Trine God. We praise you. We love you, Father. We praise you. We love you, Lord Jesus. And we praise you. We love you, Holy Spirit. We depend on you, Holy Spirit. We need you, Holy Spirit. <clears throat> we don't just need you to preach and teach. We need you to live. We need your grace, your mercy, your love, your power, life from your presence to live the Christian life, to live the spiritual life, to live the holy life, not just biologically, but spiritually, because all life is from you, Spirit, in union with the Father and the Son. So seal us for the glory of Jesus and fill us for the glory of Jesus and perfect us for the glory of Jesus and save us for the glory of Jesus and crucify our flesh and save us from the stains of our flesh for the glory of Jesus. And let our hearts become the throne of the Son of God, the heart of the Father who became flesh. Please, Holy Spirit, wash us in the blood of Jesus Christ. And Holy Spirit, please bless our loved ones who are not saved. Bring them to the feet of Jesus. Our spouses, our children, our parents, our relatives, our siblings, who, whomever they may be, bring them to the feet of Jesus. In my case, my precious daughters, seal them. In your love, Holy Spirit, perfect them and preserve them and wash them in the blood of Jesus. Even their mother, convict her, be a fire in her heart to fall before the feet of Jesus Christ. Bless this session, Holy Spirit. Empower me to recall passages and interpret them correctly and perfectly. Purify my motives, not to do it for the praise of men, not to do it for money, not to do it to tickle ears. And save me from being unrighteous in my anger. 
unnecessarily offensive. Crucify our flesh, mortify our flesh, and fill us with fruit from your presence, Holy Spirit. Fill us, we beseech you and we beg you. In the name of Jesus, we need you, Holy Spirit. You are the Spirit of the Father and the Son, the Lord Jesus. Fill my lungs and chest and throat with the breath of life, with life from your presence, Spirit, because I need you, Holy Spirit. We need you for all aspects of life, spiritual, biological, physical, mental, emotional life. Anything that is good and pleasant and perfect is from you. So just fill us for the glory of Jesus and bless this session. Fill them, Holy Spirit. Teach them, Holy Spirit. Bless them, Holy Spirit. Seal them for the glory of Jesus and increase our love for Jesus, our passion for Jesus, and empower us to live in perfect obedience to the will of Jesus and to become more like Jesus, the Father's heart. So thank you, Holy Spirit, for doing a work in us and through us for the glory of Jesus. We need you. Have your way and guide me to answer the questions that you want me to answer. Your will, not mine. Your will, not ours. We love you, Holy Spirit. And we love you, Father. We praise you for the gift of the Holy Spirit and the gift of your Son. We love you, Lord Jesus. We praise you for who you are, the, the Son of the Father, the Son of his, love, of his love, Lord Jesus. Wash us in your blood. And we praise you for your perfect, righteous life and your cross and your resurrection. And we praise you for the gift of your Spirit because the Father's Spirit is your Spirit. And we love you in Jesus' name. Yeah, the Father, Son, Spirit. Okay, and we ask the Holy Spirit to bless the internet connection as well, right? Amen. Yeah, 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 Zina, you, you, you caught that, didn't you? You caught that, right? All right, man, you're a good, sharp one. Zina, you impressed me because as much as a hard time you give me, that means you listen and you listen attentively and you study and you go test all things. And you're trusting the Holy Spirit to perfect in you that which is true for the glory of Jesus. So you impressed me. Yeah. That only goes to show you, folks. What does that show you? Okay. What does that show you? Not everyone is going to be an expert in every field of Christian theology, right? Each person has been gifted by the Holy Spirit in a unique area, right? So we have to know where our giftings are. We, we're, we are weak and ask the Holy Spirit to perfect our weaknesses and to strengthen the strength that he's given us for the glory of Jesus Christ, right? So not every apologist is sound in biblical exegesis. That's, I'm not saying they're heretical. What I'm saying is they may be called to a particular aspect of apologetics, like saying refuting Joe's witnesses or Muslims or atheists, right? Even though... No better weapon against these various worldviews than to know your Bible, to understand your Bible, and exegete your Bible. Not everyone has spent the time to do what I would call serious exegesis of the Scriptures, because a lot of what you hear is what people have heard others sharing, men and women that they look up to, and simply repeating what they hear without testing it first to see where they're right, where they're wrong, right? So God have mercy on us. The Father have mercy on us. The Lord Jesus have mercy on us. The Holy Spirit have mercy on us and save us from error and perfect us in our understanding of Scripture and enable us to love Jesus more passionately, right? Because that's the goal. The more knowledge that we receive from the Spirit, the more passionate we need to be, the more in love we need to be with Jesus Christ and the holier we need to become, not just knowledge. I don't know, Turb. I, I don't know how to answer that question. I'm sure. I don't know. Anyway, hopefully we'll get the regulars in. I guess Hatun is doing a live stream. We're getting close to 200. I'm getting jealous. I want to get to 300 and 400, right? If uh, Boring Wood could get two heretics on his show and get 700 and put people to sleep, then surely we can get that many too. All right. Now, with that said... There were a few questions asked of me last week. I never got around to answering. So this is the time to ask questions and trust the Spirit to guide me to see which questions he would have me answer first. Amen, Vi. That's right. You need to take your apologetics locally, not just on social media. Use it exactly where God has planted you, where you're at, locally, right? 
and preach the gospel by your words and your deeds for the glory of Jesus. Hey, thank you. So I appreciate it. Guys, thank you. I keep forgetting I enabled Super Chat. You know who you are. God bless you guys for contributing. The Lord Jesus bless you. Your reward is from Jesus Christ because if you wait for me to reward you, you'll be waiting a long time. But anyway, let me give you some links. Someone is asking me about writing responses to refute Unitarian heretics. Now, here's the thing. I have a debate scheduled with a Unitarian heretic named Andrew Griffith. March 19, I'll be debating him for Marlon Wilson's YouTube channel. Does the Gospel of John teach the deity of Jesus Christ? Does the gospel of John teach the deity of Jesus Christ? And by the way, God bless you for giving via, uh, what is a super chat? But don't forget, super chat takes 30%. <laughs> anyway, God is good. Any penny counts. Beggars can't be choosers. So in anticipation of that debate, I just posted three blog articles demonstrating from the gospel of John that Jesus Christ is depicted, portrayed as Jehovah God of the Old Testament who became flesh. So if you guys are interested in reaching the Unitarians, I'm now going to post the links to those articles. And these are articles that if you know how to present them, you understand the arguments, understand the exegesis of these passages, and know how to articulate the points by the grace of God's Spirit, the arguments that Jesus, Jehovah God in the flesh are irrefutable to any honest seeker of truth. So are you guys ready for me to share the links? Are you guys ready? Let me share it. Link number one. And make sure to read the articles that I link to at the end of each of these blog posts. At the end of these blog posts, I link to other articles for further reading, further information. So here is link number one. Link number one. Jesus Christ, the God of the patriarch, patriarchs and prophets. The God of the patriarchs and prophets. I'm going to post the link more than once. Here I show you that according to the gospel of John, according to the gospel of John, the God that Abraham saw in worship, the God that Isaiah saw in worship, was none other than the Lord Jesus Christ in his pre-human existence. Jesus appeared to the patriarchs and to <clears throat> Isaiah and others as God Almighty, as Jehovah. And he did so before he became an actual flesh and blood human being. Because Jesus only became an actual human being when he condescended to be born from his blessed virgin mother by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's the only time that Jesus actually became a human being took on an actual human nature and a physical body when he was born as a babe, right? Became a toddler, adolescent, and then a mature adult, okay? In the Old Testament, he wasn't human in nature. He hadn't become human in nature when he appeared to them in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, he would assume a visible form, a visible shape resembling that of a human being, but he didn't become human. You guys with me there? Here's the, the link to the article again. You understand the difference between Jesus becoming an actual human being and simply appearing in human form. In the Old Testament, Jesus appeared as a man but never became a man. So he took the visible shape of a man but never became a man. But Jesus did become an actual human being when he entered the blessed womb of his blessed mother who conceived his human nature and physical body as a virgin by the power of the Holy Spirit. That was the only time... Jesus became an actual human being. So I want this to sink in by the grace of God's spirit. So understand the difference between Jesus appearing as a man, but not becoming human and becoming human, adding another nature, a second nature to his person. Everyone got it? You understand the difference? Everyone got that? Send uh, Aramachi back to the black stone to smooch it like the pagan that he is. We got another pagan stone liquor here trying to cause problems. Again, here's the article again. I just posted the link three times. That's the first article. 
Here's another article, and I will explain some of these points because one of the questions that arose had to do with the concept of agency, which I alluded to in the previous sessions. I had asked, do you guys want me to show you from the scriptures where the apostles are said to be the agents of Jesus Christ? Someone said yes, but I never got around to quoting those verses. So we trust the Holy Spirit to loosen my tongue, save me from error, to bless you for the glory of Christ as we go real deep into the scriptures. Here's the second article. Here's the second article. This article is titled, Jesus Christ, the Living Bread from Heaven. This is another article proving from John, Jesus is God Almighty in the flesh, refuting the demonic, pernicious heresy of Unitarianism. Let me be upfront. Unitarianism is a doctrine of the devil. It's from the pit of hell, and it's a blasphemy against Jesus Christ. Unitarians are not your brothers and sisters. They are children of the devil until and unless they repent and worship the true Jesus. Okay, so here's the link again. This is the second article. Helping you refute Unitarianism and proving from John's gospel, Jesus existed in heaven before he became flesh. Okay, are you saving the links? Are you saving the links? Let's pray we get over 200. Okay. Now, the third article. Whom did the Baptist prepare the way for? The reason why you're going to like this article, whom did the pap Baptist prepare the way for, is because I show not just the Gospel of John, but the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, along with the Book of Acts. All four Gospels and the Book of Acts identify John the Baptist as the voice that would cry out in the wilderness in fulfillment of the prophecy of Isaiah chapter 40. In one of the previous sessions, I went in depth on that prophecy. So go back and look for that session. But I'll repeat some of the points because remember, we are creatures of repetition. We need to hear something repetitively until by the grace of God's spirit, it becomes second nature. Okay, now. One, one of the ways you prove that Jesus is Jehovah God who became flesh and not merely a human creature is to go to those places in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John where all four Gospels quote Isaiah chapter 40 verses 3 to 5 and identifying John the Baptist as the voice that Isaiah said would cry out in the wilderness announcing to the people in the wilderness prepare for Jehovah Jehovah is coming, prepare, make a highway for our God, and all flesh shall see the glory of Jehovah. That's the prophecy. The Gospel of John, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and Acts, all agree, all testify, John the Baptist is that voice in the wilderness who came to announce to the people, Jehovah is coming, be prepared for his coming, you will see the glory of Jehovah, Make a highway for our God. Our God is about to show up. And all four Gospels, including Acts, identify Jesus Christ as the one that John the Baptist came to prepare the way for. Here's the article again. You understand what that means? No, it's not Yahweh. It's Jehovah. Do yourself a favor. Educate yourself. Look for Nehemiah Gordon, Nehemiah Gordon, Nehemiah Gordon on YouTube. And he has actually produced evidence from medieval manuscripts written by rabbinic Jews. Jewish manuscripts, medieval manuscripts produced by rabbinic Jews showing the Jews have always known the correct pronunciation of the divine name. And the way they pronounce it is Yahovah, Yahovah, from which we get Jehovah. So, Kenyer. Correct yourself. Okay. Now, did you get that link? Thank you, King Silico. God bless you. God bless all of you guys. Okay. Did you get these links? Three articles, Turb and everyone else. I just gave you links to the three articles, all of which help you expose Unitarianism as a doctrine of Satan, showing from the Gospel of John, Jesus is the pre existent eternal Son, Jehovah Almighty, who became flesh. Okay, well, that said, let me answer the first question, and then we'll trust the Spirit to guide me, right? 
to answer additional questions. Where do we find in the New Testament that the apostles are the agents of Jesus Christ, his emissaries, his inspired spokespersons, so that if you hear them, you're hearing Christ. Are you ready for that evidence? Because I'm going to help you use this evidence to refute Unitarianism, to expose it for the satanic lie that it is. His name is Nehemiah Gordon. Ne Nehemiah Gordon, can you do a search? Nehemiah Gordon, and he provides proof from medieval Jewish sources that the rabbis have always known the pronunciation of divine name, and they pronounce it Yahovah, Yehovah, where we get Jehovah, not Yahweh. Okay. I'm going to show you where the Bible says the apostles, even their companions, were the inspired spokespersons of Jesus, his mouthpiece on earth, his agents on earth who spoke with his authority, whom he authorized to speak on his behalf, and then show you how to turn that against the Unitarian to expose their perversion of Scripture and silence their blasphemy against the Lord Jesus Christ. Are you ready? Are ready to dig in? You ready? Okay. Matthew 10, verse 40. And thank Protestant for helping me to help you. Matthew 10, verse 40. Lord, have mercy and refresh us and fill us with the joy of our salvation that comes from you, the joy of your salvation that you gave to us. Matthew 10, verse 40. He that receiveth you receiveth me. Jesus speaking to the disciples. He that receives you receives me. And he that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me. Did you catch it? If they receive you, my spokesperson, they're receiving me. And if they receive me, they receive the one, the Father who sent me. That's the first passage. That's Matthew 10, verse 40. Luke 10, 16. Luke 10, 16. Luke 10, 16. Hope this is going to bless you guys. That's my goal, to be used of the Spirit, to bless you, to take you a higher level, to fall more in love with Jesus, all of us, myself included. We can't love him enough. He that heareth you, heareth me. Did you catch it? He that hears you, hears me. He that despiseth you, despiseth, despiseth me. And he that despiseth me, despiseth him that sent me. Do you see the agency here? You reject the apostles, you're rejecting Jesus. You accept the apostles, you're accepting Jesus. You love the apostles, you love Jesus. You, you see the word? So this, is, this means the apostles are Jesus' spokespersons, his agents on earth. You're getting it? In Jesus' name, we're going to reach 200. Come on now. I'm going to get excited. I want to see that get up. Come on now. More people are hearing this stuff. All right. John 13, verse 20. John 13, verse 20. This, if you, Turb and everyone else, if you understand the point I'm going to make, this is one of the most powerful refutations of Unitarianism, exposing Unitarians as heretics, agents of the devil, if you understand the argument I'm about to make. I'm helping you refute Unitarian heretics with the hopes they'll repent of their blasphemy. John 13, verse 20. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that receiveth whomsoever I send receiveth me. And he that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me. John 17, verse 18. John 17. Get ready to get blown away when we get to John 20. Okay, get ready. You guys want meat and connections and intertextuality. How these different books and different verses are all different pieces of a puzzle that when you tie them in, you see a beautiful masterpiece that blows your mind how beautiful and real the triune God is. Now, John 17, verse 18. Amen, Phantom. A sign of God's covenant with mankind. John 17, verse 18. As thou hast sent me. Now, Jesus is praying to the Father. As thou hast sent me into the world. Even so have I also sent them into the world. Note carefully, Jesus does for the apostles what the Father did for him. Like the Father in heaven sent Jesus 
to preach in the world. Jesus will send the apostles to preach in the world on his behalf with his authority. So Jesus does for and through the apostles what the Father did for and through Jesus. And Jesus is doing this while he's in heaven. He's assuming the role that the Father assumes in heaven, meaning Jesus in heaven commissions people on earth like the Father in heaven commissions people on earth, like the Father sent Jesus from heaven to the earth, right? Or when he sends angels to the earth. But that's not the point. Focus on this. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. Now here, obviously, it doesn't mean the apostles were not of the world, but from some other place that were sent into the world. Here, they were already in the world, but he separated them from the world. So they no longer belong to the world, but separated them from the world, making them his own possession, but kept them in the world to preach as his agents. Right? So far, are you with me? The difference with Jesus is he wasn't part of the world and sent into the world that he was a part of to preach. He was from heaven sent into the world. The apostles were part of the world and kept in the world to preach to the world that they were taken out of and made the possession of Christ. Jesus, on the other hand, was with the Father in heaven that entered the world to preach to the world. Okay, so far, if you're with me, here's where you're going to start getting blown away. John 20, 21. John 20. This is now the first Easter Sunday, the post-resurrection appearance of Jesus, the post-resurrected Christ, the immortal Christ, now raised in his physical body, made immortal, indestructible. He's appearing now alive. It's the third day. Then said Jesus to them again, peace be unto you. As my father has sent me, even so send I you. You see? What the Father did for me, I do for you. What the Father did through me, I do through, through you. So he's assuming the position and role of the Father to the disciples. So what the Father did in and through Christ, Christ is now doing in and through the apostles. A work he began doing after the resurrection and continues to do in heaven. Okay, but that's not where it should blow you away. Here's where it's going to blow you away. John 20, 22 to 23. John 20, 22 to 23. Get ready. I don't know if Vine is here or you left, but here's where you're going to get blown away. John 20, 22 to 23. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. He breathed the Holy Spirit on them. <sighs> you got to listen now. He breathed on them the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. Okay, now, 23. Watch what's going to happen. Watch what's going to happen. Let me just read 23, though. Exactly, Mickey. Just follow with me, though. Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. Whosoever <clears throat> sins ye retain, they are retained. Now, notice what Jesus said. As the Father sent me, I send you to preach the gospel. So whoever believes, you can pronounce they're forgiven. Whoever rejects, you can pronounce they remain in their sins. They stand condemned. But now wait, though. I got to now breathe spiritual life on you. <sighs> Receive the Holy Spirit. So he breathed on them spiritual life to make them spiritually alive. Number one, you will not find a single place in the Old Testament. Here's where I need you to listen now. You will not find a single place in the entire Old Testament where someone other than Jehovah God pours out the Spirit, gives the Spirit, breathes out the Spirit. That's something the Old Testament ascribes to Jehovah God alone. That's number one. Number two, don't forget when this is taking place. This is taking place on the third day, the first Easter Sunday, the day Jesus rose in his physical body, made immortal and destructible. But now here's where the wow is going to be. Wow, wow, wow. Okay. If you start, we're not going to quote. You don't need to quote. I just want you to write this down or listen. If you start reading from John 19, 38, all the way into chapter 20, 
it says that Jesus was buried in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, which was in a garden. Pay attention, in a garden. Jesus' tomb was in a garden. When Jesus rose from the dead, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and found two gardeners. She thought they were gardeners. This is in John 20, but they were angels. So notice, two angels that she mistook to be gardeners. And then Jesus says to her, woman, why do you weep? Why weepest thou? And then she turned, because her back was to him and it was early dawn. Then she recognizes Jesus and she goes, Rabboni, and she touched him, clung unto him. And Jesus said, stop clinging to me. So notice Jesus called her woman and she touched him and clinging. And he says, stop clinging to me. The reason why she was cleaving to him is because she had thought they had stolen the body. And now that she saw him alive, she never wanted to let him go. So after touching him, Jesus says, don't panic, Mary. Don't panic. This won't be the last time you're going to see me. So you don't need to be clinging to me. But don't forget, she was touching him. Folks, I don't know if you got it. Garden. Woman in the garden. Two angels that she confused to be gardeners. The last Adam buried in uh, the garden. So you have the Garden of Eden reversed. In the Garden of Eden, you had the first man, Adam, eat of the forbidden tree and die. So death occurred, took place in a garden, right? And a woman was there. And then God assigned two cherubim to prevent Adam and Eve from coming back into the garden to eat the tree of life. Here you have the garden in which the last Adam conquers death in the garden. He destroys death in the garden. He brings in immortality in the garden. And there you have a woman touching the tree of life, which they were not allowed to. And there you have two angels in the garden. Full circle indeed. Do you guys catch what's happening in John? What happened in Genesis 3 is now reversed with the last Adam. Death entered the world in a garden. Immortality, the destruction of death, entered the world in a garden. A woman was in the garden, right, and was forbidden from touching the tree of life, and she was expelled with the, the first Adam, and two cherubim were standing there, not allowing them to enter the garden to have access to the tree. Here in this garden, you have two angels, spirit creatures, like the cherubim were spirit creatures. And this woman is allowed in the garden to touch the tree of life, who had now come to life, destroying death in the garden. Are you catching it? But I don't think you caught it. No, I don't think you caught it yet. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. Back to back with John, John 20, 22. No, I don't think you caught it yet. Genesis 2, verse 7, back to back with John 20, verse 22. Watch what's going to happen here. And you see Jesus called her woman, right? Woman, why weepest thou? What was Eve called in Genesis 2 and 3? Woman. You saw the connection there? In John 20, he says, woman, why weepest thou? Why do you weep, woman? A woman in the garden. She's called woman. Another woman in the garden. That woman ate of the forbidden tree and was not allowed to touch the tree of life. This woman was allowed into the garden to touch the tree of life. <whistles> exactly, family, Windholm. Family, you made the connection. The shame that that woman brought in the garden is now removed in John 20. Because notice who is the first one to touch the tree of life and the first one to see the risen Lord? A woman. Just like it was the woman who ate of the forbidden fruit, it was the woman who was allowed to be the first to touch the tree of life. So the dishonor of that woman 
has been removed by the honor of this woman. Right? Thank you, Lisa. God bless you guys. And you're telling me this Bible is not the Word of God. Okay, now, one more time, Genesis 2, verse 7, and John 20, 22. One more time. Genesis 2, verse 7, and John 20, 22. One more time. Watch here. And Jehovah God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Now notice what Jesus does, who's Jehovah in the flesh. John 20, 22. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. There is your Jehovah God, the same God who breathed the breath of life into the man in the garden, making him a living soul, is now breathing spiritual life, regenerating them, rejuvenating them, making them spiritual life by breathing on them the Holy Spirit. Did you make that connection? Exactly, medic for Christ. A woman was allowed to touch the tree of life first. I have no idea what you're asking me. Did you catch it now? Jehovah God breathed the breath of life in the nostrils of that man, making him a living soul. Here's Jehovah God in the flesh, Jesus Christ, breathing the Holy Spirit on his disciples to make them alive again spiritually. Right? To resurrect them spiritually. To regenerate them spiritually. Is it a coincidence that the Gospel of John has Jesus' tomb in a garden, Jesus destroying death in a garden, ushering immortality in a garden, when it was a garden that death was first introduced into the world that spread to all mankind? Is it a coincidence that in that tomb, Lay the body of Christ that came to life, conquering death. And that tomb is in a garden where you have two angels that Mary thought were gardeners and a woman that was there, whom Jesus calls woman, who touches him the tree of life. Just like in Genesis 3, you had a woman in the garden and then two cherubim, spirit creatures, that were placed there to bar them from touching the tree of life. Coincidence? Coincidence? Okay, so you're seeing, right? Jesus is everywhere in the Old Testament. Now, John 20, 22, in of itself shows that Jesus is Jehovah God in the flesh. Right? Because he does what the Old Testament says only God can do. Breathe out the Spirit, pour out the Spirit, send forth the Spirit, and give biological, spiritual life. So John 20, 22 is sufficient in of itself to show that Jesus does what Jehovah does, right? But let's focus on agency. Let's focus on agency. You saw clear proof, right? That Jesus said to the disciples, I send you as the Father sent me. Who receives you, receives me. Who rejects you, rejects me. Who despises you, despises me and the one who sent me, right? So the disciples and the apostles that were authorized by Christ, sent out by Christ, and the power of the Holy Spirit that Christ gave them were Christ's agents on earth, right? Mike Mullins, you're kidding me, right? Do I need to show you that? If I show you in Genesis 3, 20 to 24, where the cherubim were placed there to keep... Adam and Eve from entering the garden and eating of the tree of life. What are you going to tell me, Mike Mullins? Genesis 3, 20 to 24. Specifically, Genesis 3, 23 to 24. 
Okay. Now, for the rest of you, Jesus' disciples are his agents. So if I hear Paul and I receive Paul, I'm receiving Jesus, correct? Yep. Hit that like button, guys. We want to go over 500. Some more verses to prove that. 2 Corinthians 13, 3. Sandra, why do you keep asking me questions that are not directly re relevant to the topic? Can you wait on your questions and focus on what we're discussing so you can learn this for the glory of Christ? Okay. Let's go to 2 Corinthians 13, 3 and 10. 2 Corinthians 13, verse 3 and 10. Since ye seek a proof of Christ speaking in me, which to you word is not weak, but is mighty in you. And then 10. 2 Corinthians 13, 10. Therefore, I write these things being absent. And I hope Medic is not getting into a side discussion and losing focus because he has a bad habit of doing this. He even got someone blocked because he... It's not Medic. I'm sorry. Lord, forgive forgive me, Medic. It's Methodius. You're a good brother, Methodius, because he has an M-E-T. I got it confused with M-E-D. That tells you I'm illiterate like Muhammad. Methodius, focus, brother. Michael, focus. Let's focus on this in Jesus' name. Because if you're talking about other issues, you're not focusing, you're not going to learn. Okay? Sorry, Medic. I'm illiterate like Muhammad. I misread M-E-T with M-E-D. Sorry. Now, 2 Corinthians 13, verse 10. Let's focus for your benefit to learn this so you can use it to glorify Jehovah Jesus. 2 Corinthians 13, 10. Therefore, I write these things being absent, lest being present I should use sharpness according to the power which the Lord hath given me to edification, not to destruction. So Paul says, Christ speaks through me and he's given me power to instruct, to edify, or discipline. <clears throat> okay. Now, how do these passages destroy Unitarianism. All right, now are you ready for me to help you expose Unitarianism for the satanic lie that it is? Are you ready? Because I'm trying to help you make the best case that Jesus is Jehovah God, not simply a human creature. Okay. One of the arguments that these heretics will use is the concept of agency. The Hebrew term is shaliach, shaliach, right? They'll say that according to the Bible, a person's agent, because he speaks with the authority of the one who sent him, can be identified as the one he represents. In other words, let me give you an example. Protestant is my agent. So I send Protestant to first and last. Someone can say, did you see what Sam said to first and last? Even though I never said a word to first and last, Protestants spoke to him on, on my behalf, right? So this concept is a biblical one in that when an agent speaks for someone else, you can skip the agent and just go to the source. In other words, if Protestants speaking for me, not him, and he's speaking for me to, to first last, you can skip the fact that Protestant was speaking and say, Sam said this to first and last, even though I never said anything to him directly. But you realize that because Protestant was speaking for me, it's not his words, but my words, which he conveyed. So you can put him aside and just say that Sam told first and last X, Y, and Z. Okay. Do you understand what agency is? Do you understand what agency is now? So how do these Unitarian heretics use this concept to prove Jesus isn't God? They'll say, Jesus is called God because he's the Father's agent, invested with the Father's authority, and the Father authorized him to speak for the Father. So he's called God in that sense of being God's agent, not because he's God in essence. Okay. Now, how do you refute that? You ready to refute it? Now, are you ready to refute this lie to show that this is a misapplication of this concept, misappropriation of this concept? It is true that if an agent speaks on behalf of another, you can say, when that agent speaks to a certain individual, you can say that in the case of Protestants speaking for me to first and last, Sam said this to first and last. However, 
the agent can never go around and identify himself as the one he represents. In other words, though Protestant believer speaks for me, he cannot go up to first class and say, hey, I'm Sam Shamoon in the flesh. And first last cannot say, Sam Shamoon to Protestant. And this is clear from the apostles. Just because the apostles spoke on behalf of Christ, were authorized by Christ, and Christ spoke through them, no apostle could go around saying, I am the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm the Son of God who died on the cross for you. And no one could call Paul my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Right? Do you understand? Do you understand how this... Agency doesn't prove the point they seek to make. Get it. Wasn't Paul Jesus' agent? Yes. So why did Paul go on saying, I am the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God who died for you? And why did they call him Jesus? Lord Jesus, welcome. Because an agent cannot claim to be the one that he represents. Nor can someone identify the agent with the person he represents. You can't do that. Therefore. You cannot call Jesus God, worship him as God, and Jesus can't identify himself as God if, he's, if he isn't truly God in essence. That doesn't work. That's the first point. Did you get that first point? Right? Another argument they will bring up to try to prove that Jesus isn't God in essence, but he can be called God because he's God's agent. They'll say the reason why Jesus can be worshipped as Thomas's Lord and God or be called God is because the Father lives in him. The Father is in him. Let's go to John 14. Let's read 7 to 11. So I'm helping you refute Unitarianism as a satanic lie. God bless you, all of you guys who are given to the Super Chat, Tony. Psy Christian, everyone else, there's many of you. God bless you. The Lord Jesus reward you for showing love and kindness. Okay, John 14, 7, 11. Guys, please understand this refutation. I promise you, if you understand this refutation, you will silence these Unitarian heretics, as I'm about to do to Andrew Griffith by the power of Jehovah Jesus. In Jesus' name. Okay, John 14, 7 to 11. If you had known me, you should have known my father also. And from henceforth ye know him, and have seen him. Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it suffice, sufficeth us. Man, the King James is hard on my tongue, especially when you have a lisp. Fucker and fuck attacks. <laughs> All right. Read now 9 to 11. Read with me. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that has seen me hath seen the Father. How sayest thou then, show us the Father? Okay, now watch. Notice the argument and how to demolish it. Believest thou not that I am in the Father and the Father in me? So the Father is in me. The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. So their argument is, you see? Because the Father was living in Jesus, you could call Jesus God because you were addressing the Father in him as God, not Jesus. Thank you, Alistair. You understand their objection? You understand their objection? The Father being in the Son and the Son being in the Father qualifies Jesus to be called God because you're acknowledging the God in him. Because God the Father is in him, working through him, you can call Jesus God because it's not him you're calling God, but the Father in him. You understand their objection? Because I'm going to show you how to obliterate, annihilate that objection. Are you ready? Are you ready to annihilate that objection? Who's ready? Who's excited to learn how to destroy all these satanic heresies? against the triune God, against the glory of Jehovah Jesus, and proclaim Jesus for who he truly is, God in the flesh, as we rightly divide the word of truth. 
Okay, let's do this. The same Gospel of John, 14, John 14, 20 to 21. John 14, 20 to 21. You got to hear this over and over again till it becomes second nature. John 14, 20 to 21. Watch here. At that day, ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye, all you disciples, in me, and I in you, I am in all of you, he that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him, and will manifest myself to him. I'm in you, you're in me, I'm in the Father, Father in me. John 17, 20 to 23. Be patient as we unpack this. John 17, 20 to 23. John 17, 20 to 23. Watch here. John 17, 20 to 23. Read with me. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. So not just the disciples, all believers who believe. I'm praying for all of them. That means he's praying for us now. And all Christians who will believe after us until Jesus returns. So he's praying for all of us. Notice what he says about all of us. Okay. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. That they... All may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me, one in us, united in us, in us, Father and I, they're in Father and I, and the glory which thou hast given me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. Now notice 22, 23, and the glory which thou hast gavest me, I have given them, right, that thou may be one, as we are one. I in them, Father. I'm in all of them. The disciples and all who believe after them. That means he's in us right now. He indwells us right now. In them. I in them. Thou in me. They are one in us. You in me. I in them. Them in me. That, them, that they may be perfect in one. That the world may know that thou hast sent me and has loved them as thou hast loved me. So Jesus is in all believers. He indwells all believers. He fills all believers in the same way the Father is in him. And all believers are one in him and the Father. Father and Son in us. We're in the Father and Son. The Son in all of us. 2 Corinthians 13 verse 5. Yep. This shows that Jesus is omnipresent. He's present with every believer, no matter how numerous, no matter where they're at, to the same degree, to the same extent that the Father is showing that Jesus is claiming to be omnipresent, omniscient. But wait. Yep, it is. Bas, Basimer. 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5. Examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you? If you're a true believer, he's in all of you. Hmm. Except ye be re reprobates. So Jesus is in all of us. All true believers. Okay. Colossians 1.27. Wait. We're going to have a field day with the Unitarian heretics. This is what I'm going to do to this guy in our upcoming debate by the grace of Jehovah Jesus. Expose him and his doctrine to be satanic in origin. Okay. Colossians 1.27. To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, in all of you. The hope of glory. So Christ is in all of us. That's the mystery revealed. That God has Christ indwelling all believers, filling them, loving them, right? Preserving them. So Christ is in us. Wow. Interesting. 1 Corinthians 3.16. Okay, Andrew, you can listen to the archive later. God bless you. And Marcy, God bless you and strengthen you for your 16-hour shift. Watch here. 1 Corinthians 3, 16. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God and the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? So now God's Spirit is in all of us. God's Spirit is in all of us. He dwells all true believers, making us the temple of God. 1 Corinthians 6, 19. 
Watch what's going to happen, folks, to this argument. Watch what's going to happen to this argument. Right? 1 Corinthians 6, 19. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you? So Holy Spirit is in all of you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? So wait, the Holy Spirit is in all of us, making us the temple of God. Jesus is in all of us, if we're true believers. We are, one, in union with Christ and the Father. So we're in the Father and the Son. Now Romans 8, 9 to 11. Romans 8, 9 to 11. If you learn these arguments, you will obliterate Unitarianism for the satanic lie that it is. God bless you, Sophie. Watch here. If you learn these arguments. Romans 8, 9 to 11. Guys, pay attention who, who lives in us. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. So we're now in the spirit as we are in the Father and the Son. Right? If so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. So if you're in the spirit, that means God's spirit lives in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. So notice, if you're in the spirit, that means the spirit of God is in you, which is the spirit of Christ. So God's spirit is Christ's spirit. He's the Holy Spirit that belongs to God in Christ. And if we're in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is in us. That means the Holy Spirit that belongs to God and Christ is in us. But now notice verse 10. And if Christ be in you, okay, I'm confused. Paul, is it the spirit of God in me? Or is it the spirit of Christ in me? Or is it Christ in me? All of the above. The Holy Spirit belongs to God, so he's the spirit of God. The Holy Spirit also belongs to Christ, so he's the spirit of Christ. And if the Holy Spirit is in you, then God and Christ are in you because it's the spirit who mediates God's presence to us. The body is dead because of sin. Because we have sin in the flesh, that's why we die until the end of the age. Even though our inner man, our spiritual man is alive, right? But the spirit is life because of righteousness. Not, but if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you. So the spirit of him that raised Jesus from the dead, the spirit of the father dwells in you. He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Okay, folks, pay attention to what you just read. God the Father, God. Jesus Christ, the Son. The Holy Spirit, all of them dwell in us, are in us. We are in them. Now, if the Unitarian is right, that Jesus can be called God because the Father lives in him, that means you can be called Father, Son, and Holy Spirit because the Godhead lives in you. So that means I can look at Protestant believer and say, Protestant, you too are my Lord and my God. Protestant, you are my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Protestant, you are the Holy Spirit. Do you see how stupid that argument is? Do you see how silly and stupid and blasphemous that argument is? How desperate they are in their blasphemy to deny that Jesus is God. Jesus isn't God because the Father lives in him. Jesus is God because he shares the same essence with the Father. Because if, Je if Jesus is God because the Father is in him, you are God. The angels are God. I am God because God dwells in his creation and he fills all creation. Let me prove that to you. You ready? Ephesians 3, 17 to 19. Pay attention to 19. Ephesians 3, 17 to 19. Watch here. So we just destroyed two of their main objections. Two of their main objections. That Christ may dwell in your hearts, there it goes again, by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with the fullness of God. So God's fullness fills all of us. Right? But wait, let's go to Ephesians 1. 19 to 23, and pay attention to 23. Ephesians 1, 19 to 23, pay attention to 23. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us word? Who believe? God shows his great power to us. 
He uses his power for us, for our benefit. And he showed us how powerful he is, how amazing his power is, when he displayed his power by raising Jesus, immortal, according to the working of his mighty power. So <clears throat> where's the second part of the verse? Because the people keep commenting. You skip 20, brother. Protestant, I'm going to have to fire you, bro, because you've been dropping the ball. You know that 20 comes after 19, right? Not 21. You're like the NIV. You skip a verse. That's where you threw me off. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us word who believe according to the working of his mighty power? Right? I pay him nothing for nothing. And he drops the ball even though I pay him nothing for nothing. Which he wrought in Christ. He showed how glorious his power is when he used his power to raise Jesus immortal. That's how amazing God's power is. Which he wrought, which he displayed in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality. Jesus is exalted, transcends all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, this age, but also in that which is to come, the age to come, and had put all things under his feet, under the feet of Jesus. And gave him to be the head over all things to the church. So Jesus Christ is the head of all creation. All creation is subject to his headship, his authority. And notice what it says about Jesus, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. So Jesus fills the entire spiritual body of believers with his fullness. God fills the entire spiritual body of believers with all his fullness. God and Christ are filling all believers with their fullness. As a side note, this shows that Jesus is equal to God the Father. Because like the Father who fills all things, Jesus fills all things. Right? Sure, huh? Blame the phone. Eve blamed the serpent. Adam blamed Eve. And you blame the phone. You there? Okay, but now here's the final one. Ephesians 4, 7 to 10. Ephesians 4, 7 to 10. Ephesians 4, 7 to 10. Yeah, we know best. Those are Trinitarian texts. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Pay attention to this, guys. Look how amazing Jesus is. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. So Jesus, when he ascended on high, ascended to heaven, he led captivity captive and bestowed, bestowed, bestowed spiritual gifts on us, men. Now notice what it says about him, 9 and 10. Guys, pay attention carefully what it says about Jesus in verses 9 and 10. Now that he ascended, what is it? But that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth. In other words, they're saying if he ascended to heaven, that means he first descended, right? If he's already in heaven, he doesn't ascend there. The fact he ascended to heaven assumes that he had descended from heaven. He was on the earth and now went back. But now notice 10, what it says about Jesus. Pay attention about Jesus. Notice what it says about him in verse 10. He descended is the same also that ascended ab up far above all heavens that he might fill all things. So notice, Jesus fills heaven and earth, fills the heavens and the earth with his spiritual blessings, with his spiritual presence. He fills the entire creation with his spiritual presence. Did you catch it? Jesus, who descended to the earth, now ascended up above the heavens so he can fill heavens and earth, all creation, with his spiritual presence and his spiritual blessings. You're getting it or no? Hope I'm not too loud. You're getting it? As a side note, compare what Paul says about Jesus descending to, descending to the earth and then ascending above the heaven to fill heaven and earth, the entire creation, with a spiritual presence and spiritual blessings with what Job says in Jeremiah 23, 23 to 24. Watch here. Watch where I'm going to go with this.
So we're going to be done with the Unitarians after the session. Am I a God at hand, say Jehovah, and not a God afar off? Now notice what Jehovah says about himself. Can any hide himself in secret places that I shall not see him, say Jehovah? Do not I fill heaven and earth, say Jehovah? Hold on. Jehovah, you said you fill heaven and earth. Yes. But Paul says Jesus Christ fills heaven and earth. Yes. How can Jesus fill all creation? And you, Jehovah, fill all creation if Jesus isn't Jehovah. To ask the question is to answer it. Who told you he's not Jehovah? Okay, now, with that said, not only is this a proof text that Jesus is Jehovah God because he fills all creation, something only Jehovah does. He fills all creation with a spiritual presence, right? And with every spiritual blessing that comes from him. But he was also in heaven before he came to the earth. That's pre-existence. But here's the thing. Here's what I want to ask you. Yep, Colossians 3.11. Christ is all and in all. But that's referring to believers' family. He's all and in all believers. Here it says all creation is filled with Christ. Christ is filling all creation with his spiritual presence. Christ is filling the angels with his spiritual presence. Folks, let me ask you a question. If Jesus is God because he's filled with the Father, and the Father dwells in him. And that's why he's God. Doesn't this prove that every creature can be called God? Because the Father and the Son and the Spirit fill all creation, fill all angels, fill all humans with their spiritual presence. So if Jesus is God because God dwells in him and he's filled with God, then that means Gabriel is God. Michael is God. The cherubim are God. All of us are God because the Father fills all of us with his fullness. Jesus fills all of us with his spiritual fullness. So that means the angels are the Father and the Son and the Spirit. Right? But if they say, oh, no, no, but you see, Jesus was sinless. He was the only sinless man. Therefore, God dwelt, dwelt in him in all his fullness, and that's why he can be called God. But wait, 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 wait. Gabriel is sinless. Michael is sinless. And they too are filled with God. So that means they should be called God and worshipped as God as well. You see how silly, ridiculous these Unitarian objections are? So are you guys now ready? So I don't get any emails or comments. How do I refute this argument by the... Are you guys now ready to destroy these Unitarian objections? Jesus isn't God because the Father lives in him. Because the Bible says the Father lives in all true believers, the Son lives in all true believers, and the Spirit lives in all true believers. That means believers are now the Trinity, the Godhead. Jesus isn't simply God because he's God's agent. Because the disciples, the apostles, were Jesus' agents. So could the disciples call themselves Jesus, the Son of God, our Lord and Savior, or be called Jesus? Of course not. And they'd say, well, Jesus was sinless, unlike anyone else. But wait, Gabriel is sinless. Michael is sinless. And Gabriel and Michael are filled with the fullness, fullness of God filled with the fullness of the Father, filled with the fullness of the Son, filled with the fullness of the Spirit. How do I know? Because Jeremiah 23, verses 23, 24, and Ephesians 4, 10 says, Jesus and Jehovah, and Jesus is Jehovah, one with the Father and the Spirit, fill heaven and earth with the spiritual fullness, fills the entire creation with the spiritual fullness. Since the angels are part of heaven, Jesus is filling them as well, and angels are sinless, so they're filled with Jesus, filled with Jehovah. That means they can be called God. They can be called Jesus too. You see how silly this objection is? You see how pathetic and desperate this objection is? Are you learning how to refute Unitarianism? I don't know if Zena's here or Chu Jesus here. They probably left, but I hope they're listening to help them. Another thing, another thing to add. If Jesus is God and receives worship because he's God's agent, authorized by God, 
That means angels should also be worshipped because they're the agents of God. Here, let me give you an example. Let's go to Revelation 22, verse 6. No, they're not Christians, Anna. They are children of the devil, and their doctrine is from the pit of hell. May God convict them to repent, and if they don't repent, expose them and humiliate them for the glory of Jehovah Jesus. They're not your brothers and sisters. Revelation 22, verse 6. And he said unto me, These sayings are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the Holy Prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. So notice the angel is revealing to John what the Lord God wants him to see. So the angel is God's agent, authorized by God to reveal to John the revelation that God wants John to know. Revelation 22, verse 16. If you're your Unitarian heretic, when you repent, you'll be my friend. If not, I'll slaughter you in your satanic doctrine for the glory of Jehovah Jesus. Revelation 22, 16. Watch here, daily right. Revelation 22, 16. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I'm the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. Now notice, God, Jesus, sent the angel. God in heaven, Jesus in heaven, sent an angel from heaven to reveal to John the things that John is supposed to write down. Pay attention. God in heaven, Jesus in heaven, sent this angel. That means this angel is the agent of God in heaven, the agent of Jesus who's in heaven, speaking with their authority. Therefore, if Jesus can be worshipped as God because he's the Father's agent, then this angel should also be allowed to be worshipped because the worship isn't really given to him. It's given to God whom he represents, right? But notice what the angel does when he's worshipped. Revelation 19.10. Revelation 19.10. Simeon, put down the pipe, son. Put down the bottle because you're stoned if you think that can be used for Muhammad. Okay. Revelation 19.10. Watch here. And I fell at his feet, that angel, to worship him. And he said unto me, See thou, do it not. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Wait, angel. Why are you re refusing to be worshipped? Aren't you God's agent, authorized by God? Yes. Aren't you Jesus' agent, authorized by Jesus? Yes. So why are you refusing worship? I'm really worshiping God, whom you represent, not you. Why are you saying, don't worship me? All I am is a fellow slave with you and the prophets. Revelation 22, verses 8 to 9. Revelation 22, verses 8 to 9. Watch here. And I, John, saw these things and heard them. And when I had heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel, which showed me these things. Angel, then saith he unto me, See thou, do it not. For I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren, the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book, worship God. But wait, angel, aren't you that angel that the Lord God sent to me? Revelation 22, verse 6. Watch. Revelation 22, verse 6. Aren't you the angel that God sent to me? Here, Revelation 22, 6. And he said unto me, These things are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the Holy Prophet sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. Yes, I'm that angel. Why did you refuse me worshiping you a second time? Don't you get it? The Unitarians tell me you're authorized by God as God's agent. So I can worship you because I'm not really worshiping you. I'm worshiping God that you represent. Why are you rejecting that? Why are you saying you're just a servant, a slave like me, like the prophets? What's wrong with you? Don't you know about Shaliach, the concept of agency? Or you got to wait for Anthony Buzzer to show up to teach you. See how stupid that is? Okay, you understand what you just learned? Let me, let me wrap up what you learned. An agent cannot be worshipped as God. An agent cannot call himself God. An agent cannot be called God because agency will not allow for an agent to identify himself as God, to receive the worship due to God, and perform the functions that only God can perform. Agency 
will not account for all of that. Here's an angel, God's agent, Jesus' agent, but he refuses to be worshipped because even though I'm the angel of God, I'm a creature. Don't worship me. Direct it to him, not to the agent or to him through me. No. You get it now? But here, let me give you a brownie point here. Revelation 22, 6 and 16. Now let's turn this around and show you that Jesus is God, one with the Father and the Spirit. Revelation 22, 6 and 16. And he said unto me, these things are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. The Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel. But wait, nine verses later, well, you want to say 10, right? 10 verses later, same chapter. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. Wait, 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 wait. John. You just said in Revelation 22, 6, the Lord, the God of the prophets, sent his angel to you. But then in that same chapter, you just said, Jesus told you, Jesus sent his angel. So, John, who sent the angel to you from heaven? Was it the Lord God in heaven that sent his angel? Or was it Jesus in heaven who sent his angel? And why would God need someone other than him in heaven to send an angel from heaven? I can understand someone on earth representing God. But why in heaven is someone other than God, Jesus Christ, doing the things that the Old Testament shows only God does, dispatch angels from heaven? Jesus is in heaven sending his angel. Why would it be his angel when he's in heaven? And why is he sending the angel in heaven? Why isn't God doing it? Agency will not account. For someone other than God in heaven doing the things of God in heaven. Agency only works on earth. When you're in heaven, the last place that God needs an agent is in heaven. So why is Jesus in heaven with the Father doing things that only God does according to the Old Testament? Jesus in heaven is sending an angel that belongs to him from heaven. Do you got it or no? Is it sinking in? Is it sinking in? All right. Well, let's tie it in again. Revelation 22, verse 6, with another passage. Let's tie this again, but with another passage. Revelation 22, verse 6. Turb, did you get irrefutable ammo showing why Unitarianism is a heresy of the devil? Revelation 22, verse 6. And he said unto me, These sayings are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. Now notice, he's the Lord God of the holy prophets. He is the Lord God of the holy prophets. All right. Jesus speaking in Matthew 23, 34. Jesus speaking in Matthew 23, 34. Watch here. Wherefore, Jesus speaking, folks, this is the words of Jesus. He's speaking. Wherefore, behold, I send unto you prophets. Who do you think you are, Jesus, that you send prophets? And wise men. You're going to also raise up scholars and scribes. Wise men, scholars, and prophets. You're going to send them? And some of them ye shall kill and crucify, and some of them shall ye scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city. Hold on, Jesus. It is Jehovah God from heaven who sends prophets and raises up scholars and wise men. But you're saying you, Jesus, will send prophets to the people. And you're even telling the people what they're going to do to them before it comes to pass. I send unto you prophets. Is that what you're saying, Jesus? But hold on, Jesus. Jeremiah 7, 25. You're confusing me, Jesus. You're confusing me, Lord. Jeremiah 7, 25. Watch here, Jeremiah 7, 25. Since the day that your fathers came forth out of the land of Egypt unto this day, I have even sent unto you all my servants the prophets, daily rising up early and sending them. Wait, wait, Jehovah, 
You're the one who sent the prophets who are your servants to the people? Yes. Jesus, you're the one who's going to be sending prophets to Israel? Yes. But wait, Jesus, you're only going to do that when you're in heaven. Yes. Why are you again doing something in heaven that the Old Testament says only Jehovah does? And the last place that Jehovah needs an agent doing something for him is in heaven. I understand if you're on earth. In heaven, you're going to send prophets? In heaven? Why does God need you to send prophets from heaven? You're in heaven, right? Why are you sending prophets while you're in heaven? That's the work of Jehovah, Jesus. Is it making sense? Is it sinking in? Okay. The final argument to destroy Unitarianism as a satanic heresy. March 19, God willing, Mickey Afrata. Let me try to see if I can find the link. Let me see. And you got all the links to the articles, right? Let me see if I can find Oops, sorry. The final way to destroy you. These are all of my articles, by the way, folks. It's all of my articles. So if you read it, it's there. I gave you the links at the beginning of the session. And Lord willing, after the session's done, I'll put them in the description box. But let me find that link. Hold on. Pray in Jesus' name. Because I plan by the power of Jehovah Jesus to annihilate his arguments and expose his doctrine as a satanic heresy. Okay? That's my plan. Like I did with that oneness, modalist pastor, that heretic. All right? I do not tolerate any blasphemies against Jehovah Jesus that rob Jesus of the glory he deserves and deny who he is, our God. One second, let me get you the link. Final argument, all of my articles, everything I showed you, Lord willing. For now, God willing, I'll do another live Q&A tomorrow. So if you want, I'll do the entire week again of live Q&A. But do me a favor, send your questions either in the comment section or email, right? So I can get to them. Lord willing, let me get you the link. It's got to be somewhere here. Just bear with me as I find it. All right. Final one for now. Because I'm going to do Jesus as a living bread tomorrow. I'll probably retitle this. Leaving QA refuting Unitarian arguments. Because I think it's important, right? We need to get into this. Here you go. Here's the link. Let me go there. Here you go. Here's the link, folks. Pray that Jehovah Jesus will be glorified through my meager efforts. Okay, there you go. That's the link one more time. Some loudmouth who thinks he's good enough to defend his satanic doctrine and refute the glory of Jehovah Jesus. I will, TB, TBL James, I will. Okay, final argument that Jesus is not God because he's God's agent. Jesus is God because that's who he is, Jehovah in the flesh. Jehovah in the flesh. And Daily Gripe, this will show you how pitiful and shameful that oneness, modalist, heretic pastor truly is. He just did a five-part series about it, what, almost a year after the debate, trying to refute the arguments I made in the debate because that tells you he realized and his fan base realized how humiliating of a defeat that was for him and for his false god. All glory to the triune god. Here's my email. Folks, you can also use this email. If God puts in your heart, you want to send something via PayPal, this is the email you use via PayPal. That's actually, if you send by PayPal, it gives you more of the proceeds. It doesn't take 30% like Super Chat does. So there goes my email, sam underscore shmn at hotmail.com. Now, final argument for today. And Lord willing, we're going to do another one tomorrow. Some more arguments, right? Now, let's go to John 1. John 1, and let's read who John the Baptist claimed to be. John 1, 23. Yes, it is, Enoch. Don't come in the midst of a discussion and ask questions if you haven't been here from the beginning. Jehovah is the correct anglicized pronunciation of the divine name, Yahovah. Look, look up ne Nehemiah Gordon. Nehemiah Gordon. I pronounce it Nehemiah. Nehemiah Gordon. And he will give you evidence from rabbinic sources that the rabbis have always known the correct pronunciation of the name, and they pronounce it Yehovah. Okay. Okay. Now John one twenty three. 
I just gave you the link, Sargon. Allahu Akbar, Sargon. There it goes. Allahu Akbar, a Unitarian heretic. John 123, focus. The final argument for now to demolish Unitarianism as a doctrine of the devil. John the Baptist speaking. He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as said the prophet Esaias. Did you guys catch it? Yeah, it is, Mickey, but that's not the email you use for PayPal. If you want to use my Yahoo for questions, feel free. Okay, but now, did you catch it? John the Baptist says, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as said the prophet Esaias. So even Mark agrees. Mark 1, 3 to 4. Mark 1, verses 3 to 4. I talked Assyrian, Syriac, a modern offshoot of Aramaic, which is the language that our Lord Jesus spoke, Sandra. Okay. Mark 1, 3 to 4. Mark agrees. John the Baptist is the voice of Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3. Pay attention now to the argument. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John did baptize in the wilderness and preach the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. So you guys, do you see John 1, 23, Mark 1, 3 to 4, both agree John the Baptist started preaching in the wilderness to fulfill Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3 says, A voice will shout out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Do you guys see that? So John the Baptist is the voice of the one crying in the wilderness according to the prophecy of Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3. So Mark and John agree. Do Matthew and Luke agree? Matthew 3, verses 1 to 3. We're going to end it with a bang. Matthew 3, verses 1 to 3. Yep, and I'm going to be done right before CP comes on. So it's good timing, right? You got me and CP. Matthew 3, verses 1 to 3. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Pay attention. Came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Esaias, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. So now Matthew agrees with Mark and John, the Gospel of John, that the Baptist fulfills Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3. So three Gospels agree. John the Baptist is the voice of Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3. You, you there? You got it? They're all agreeing? Okay, now, let's go to Luke 3, verses 1 to 6. Watch what's going to happen. Luke 3, verses 1 to 6. Now, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, right, Pontius Pilate, as the Lord Jesus perfects my sight spiritually and physically, being governor of Judea, and Herod being tetrarch of, too fast, buddy. Tetrarch of Galilee and his brother Philip, Tetrarch of Uteria, Uteria, my goodness, these names, Uteria, Uteria, Butera, okay, and of the region of Trachonitis, and Lysenius, and the Tetrarch of Abilene, Annas and Caiaphas being the high priests. The word of God came unto John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. Notice he's in the wilderness. And he came into all the country about Jordan preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins, as it is written in the book of the words of Esaias the prophet, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make his paths straight. Now pay attention to 5 and 6. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be brought low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough way shall be made smooth. Right, And all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Okay, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all agreed. You, John the Baptist, are the voice that Isaiah chapter 40, verses 3 to 5, prophesied, would be shouting in the wilderness, telling the people, 
Prepare the way of the Lord, meaning Jehovah. Make a highway for our God, and all flesh shall see his salvation. Now let's look at the prophecy itself. Isaiah chapter 40, verses 3 to 5. Isaiah chapter 40, verses 3 to 5. Isaiah chapter 40, verses 3 to 5. I got a chart. Yeah. Watch here. Now let's look at the prophecy. One second. Let's read. There's the prophecy. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness. Prepare ye the way of Jehovah. Do you see? The voice is preparing for Jehovah. Not a creature, not a spirit creature, not a human creature. This voice is preparing the people. Prepare the way for Jehovah. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. So this voice is telling the people, get ready. Jehovah, our God, is going to show up. Get ready. He's coming. Who's coming? Our God. Who? Jehovah. Now watch. Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill shall be made low. And the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough places plain. And the glory of Jehovah shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of Jehovah hath spoken it. Now, no doubt about it, John is the voice of Isaiah 40 that is preparing the people for the coming of Jehovah our God. You're about to see the glory of Jehovah. Jehovah's coming. Our God is coming. Get ready. So now, is it clear that according to Isaiah 40, John the Baptist is the agent of Jehovah God, not a creature? Jehovah God is sending John the Baptist as his emissary, as his agent, to prepare the people for his coming. Did you get that? I promise you, if you get these arguments, understand them, absorb them by the power of the Holy Spirit, you will annihilate Unitarianism. You got that? Okay. So John the Baptist is Jehovah's agent. Authorized by Jehovah to speak on his behalf and prepare the people for his coming. Okay, but wait. Let's go to Acts 19, verse 4. Acts 19, verse 4. Watch who John the Baptist prepares for. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that should believe on him, which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. Wait, John. You, Baptist, you're preparing for the coming of Christ? Yes. John 1, 29 to 34. John 1, 29 to 34. And I got some prayer announcements and a book recommendation. Praise God for his last. John 1, 29 to 34. John the Baptist speaking. The next day, notice what the Baptist says. The next day, John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. John looks at Jesus and says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now notice what he says about him. This is he of whom I said, After me cometh a man which is preferred before me, for he was before me, because he exists before me. And I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest, that he should be revealed to Israel. Therefore am I come baptizing water. I was sent to reveal him to Israel. I was sent to make him known to Israel. Israel, here's the one I was sent to prepare you for, to make him manifest to you. Who? Jesus, the Lamb of God. Notice 32 to 34. And John bare record saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. And I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same as he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. Okay. I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed. So help me unpack this. Isaiah 40 verses 3 to 5 says, Jehovah will send an agent, an envoy, an emissary in the wilderness who will be a voice shouting, prepare the way for Jehovah, make a highway for our God, because you're about to see the glory of Jehovah. So this agent represents Jehovah, sent by Jehovah to prepare for the coming of Jehovah. Not a creature, but Jehovah. Okay, that's one. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts state that voice of Isaiah 40 is John the Baptist, which is why he began his ministry in the wilderness. 
So he is Jehovah's agent, emissary, spokesperson, envoy. Okay. That means when John the Baptist shows up, right after him, Jehovah God is going to show up. <clears throat> but hold on. Third point. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the Baptist himself, all state, John the Baptist prepared the people for the coming of Jesus. And when Jesus came, he goes, here he is. That's the one. I came to reveal him to you, Jesus Christ. John the Baptist is the voice in the wilderness sent to prepare for the coming of Jehovah, Israel's God, so they can see the glory of Jehovah. But John the Baptist is preparing the people for the coming of Jesus. Jesus shows up. He goes, that's the one. He's here. That's it. I decrease, he increases. How can John the Baptist prepare people for the coming of Jesus when the one whose coming he came to prepare for was none other than Jehovah God? What's going on? Can someone help me? So we're almost done. This is it. This will be the final point. What's going on? John the Baptist is the voice sent to prepare for the coming of Jehovah, Israel's God. But John the Baptist claimed that he was sent to prepare for the coming of Jesus. Conclusion, Jesus is Jehovah God Almighty in the flesh, the very God of Israel that John the Baptist was sent to prepare for. But wait, John the Baptist also said Jesus is the Son of God, the Lamb of God, and saw the Holy Spirit descend upon him. So Jesus is not God the Father. He's the Father's Son and the Lamb that the Father provides for our salvation. And he's not the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit came down upon him in the shape of a dove. So Jesus is the Son, distinguished from the Father and the Spirit. And yet as the Son, he is Jehovah. Well, if he's Jehovah, what does that make the Father? He's Jehovah too. But the Spirit is the Spirit of Jehovah. Oh, so you mean John the Baptist just testified to Jehovah being a trinity? And one of those persons of Jehovah, namely the Son, became man? So John the Baptist was a Trinitarian? Wow. Wow. Now, for Turb and everyone else, do you know how this destroys agency again? Do you know how this destroys agency again? Let me now show you how John the Baptist destroys agency as misinterpreted, misapplied by these Unitarian heretics. When I say destroy agency, I'm not saying it's not a biblical concept. The way these heretics apply it is unbiblical. They twist it and pervert it. Can I show you how now the Baptist is their nightmare, showing their doctrines of the devil? Okay. Folks, isn't John the Baptist the agent of Jehovah? He's the agent, right? He's the agent. I, I'm going to post the articles again. He's the agent. Okay, folks, wait. If John the Baptist is Jehovah's agent, why wasn't he called Jehovah? And why didn't he call himself Jehovah? I thought an agent can be identified as the God that he represents. But wait, John the Baptist, though he's Jehovah's agent, never calls himself Jehovah, is never called Jehovah. I wonder why. Secondly, secondly, and even worse, do these heretics really want us to believe Jehovah sent an agent to prepare for another agent? Because remember, Jehovah sent John as his agent, and Jesus shows up. These heretics want you to believe that Jesus is also an agent. So in reality, the prophecy is saying Jehovah sent an agent to prepare for another agent, and that agent will be called Jehovah, but not John, who's also an agent. What? Wait, 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 wait. Jehovah sent John the Baptist as his agent to prepare for another one who's his agent. So there are two agents coming, but it says that this agent, John the Baptist, is praying for Jehovah. But you heretics are telling me Jesus is Jehovah's agent, which is why he can be called Jehovah. But John the Baptist is also Jehovah's agent. Why wasn't he called Jehovah? So you see how satanic, how perverted this doctrine is? How it perverts the scriptures to their shame and destruction, robbing Jesus of his glory? 
What they want you to believe is that Isaiah 40 is actually saying Jehovah will send an agent to prepare for the coming of another agent. And that other agent, he can be called Jehovah, but not the first agent that prepared for that agent. You see how stupid and ridiculous, unbiblical and satanic this doctrine is? So what you have in Isaiah 40 is Jehovah sending an agent to prepare for Jehovah, not another agent. But that Jehovah who shows up is Jesus, proving Jesus is not merely an agent of God. He is Jehovah in the flesh and the Father's agent because he's not the Father. He's the Father's agent, but he's one with the Father in essence, in glory, in power, in honor, and majesty, and also one with the Spirit. That's why we're Trinitarians. Right? So let me give you the articles again. Are you ready? Here is the article. Whom did the Baptist prepare the way for? Here's article one. I'm going to put in the description box, God willing, when I'm done. That's one. Save these links. I'll put them in the beginning and put them in again. The second article, God willing, I'll talk about this tomorrow. Jesus Christ, the living bread from heaven. Filthy bastard, whore, murk, cussing Jesus, blaspheming Jesus. Okay. Sorry, guys. If you see the blasphemy of Merck, because his mother's a whore, a daughter of the devil, for him to blaspheme Jesus this way. If you saw how he blasphemed Jesus, because his mother's a whore. Christians, if you get upset at me for calling his mother a whore, for blaspheming Jesus the way he did, an F-bomb at Jesus, shame on you. Don't come to my channel. This guy Merck, this filthy whore, son of a whore, who just blasphemed Jesus. Here's the PayPal. Here's the email. Black Smurf, all you go all need to do, uh, do is go to PayPal and send to this email address, Black Smurf. Okay, did you? Yeah, this guy, Mert, you didn't see his blasphemy. Anyway, did you get save the second link? Good you didn't. He just said Muhammad and used the F word against our Lord Jesus. So if you get upset at me for calling Mahor son of or, shame on you. If someone insulted your mother, you'd insult them. How much more when they insult our God, Jesus? Well, here's the link to PayPal, bro. That's all you do, man. What's up, man? You can't spell PayPal, Black Smurf? Sucker? www.paypal.com. And all you do. Okay, guys, did you save those two links? Let me post the link to the second article. Jesus, the living bread from heaven. And God, God will we'll talk about it tomorrow. Tomorrow. Okay, here is, and now the third article. Save these links, study the articles, download them, pass them on to others. Here's the third one. Jesus Christ, the God of the patriarchs and prophets. Okay. Save them. You save them? Okay, folks. Lord willing, tomorrow I'm going to do another live Q&A, thoroughly decimating Unitarianism by the grace of Jehovah Jesus in preparation for my upcoming debate. So, guys, I have one book recommendation. You need to get this book right here. Let's see. Across the Spectrum, Across the Spectrum, right, by Gregory A. Boyd and Paul R. Eddy, right? This is an excellent compendium on the different doctrines of the Christian faith and the different views of these doctrines. Very balanced, very fair. It gives you different perspectives on God's knowledge, predestination, free will, you know, Calvinism, Arminianism, middle knowledge, open theism, hell, is it forever? Very balanced at the different doctrines within evangelical Christianity, and it makes a case for all these major doctrines and arguments against them. Very balanced, very fair. This will give an idea of all the different perspectives, understandings, interpretations of some of the core doctrines of the Christian faith held by those within evangelical Christianity. Get that book. Guys, keep praying for my support to come in. Pray for my health to get healthier. Pray my daughters will be perfectly healthy, healthier than me, that the Lord Jesus will provide abundantly for their needs and mine through me because I'm going to move in my new place. Pray that God will make me holier and pray for my miracle that Jesus will bring my daughter sooner than later. And I'm not out of the woods. I've got received some more bad news. I need God to show up in the upcoming months, especially this week and in February, 
to set me free because it's becoming a burden and it's getting ridiculous. I need Jesus to keep me safe and protect me because the powers that be being empowered by Satan and a corrupt judge who's an agent of the devil is being used of the devil to try to hinder my freedoms. I need a miracle, folks. Otherwise, I'll be hindered. Christ will be done. He doesn't need me. I need him. I need a miracle, folks. I need to be freed finally. And the Lord rebuked these demons that have come against me and to set me and my daughters free and bring my daughters. Remember, I haven't seen them since June. I need a miracle. I miss them. And I'm lonely without them. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Jesus Christ is Jehovah to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus, we love you. Please pray for a miracle and for provision and that God will bless me with open doors of blessing to move in my new place, February 15. My brother joined me and my daughter's joined me sooner than later. In Jesus' name, deal with this wicked agent, this legal agent, use of the devil, Father. Please, Lord Jesus, please, Holy Spirit. It's your fight, not mine. I can't fight it. Only you can. And he loves us and is in love with us. And by the Holy Spirit, may we be in love with him. Take care. I'll see you tomorrow, God willing.